1776 was a remarkable year in American history. It defined the American spirit, our American values, and decided our fate as a great and respected nation. It was our birth year, where the Declaration of Independence was signed and the Revolutionary War fought. However, 1776 was not a pleasant time by any means. It consisted of few victories, prolonged suffering, disease, famine, cowardice, fear, and deep disappointment. While today we think of independence as an inevitability, the war was fraught with so many perils that it seemed the colonies would certainly lose and Britain would forever remain the leading power of the world. But how did we win if this was the case? Through his novel, David McCullough seeks to prove that America won the Revolutionary War through its strong will, excellent political leadership, and abundance of sheer luck, and that 1776 exemplified these traits. McCullough has written a multitude of fascinating historical novels, ranging from a riveting biography of John Adams to his most critically acclaimed book, The Path Between the Seas, about building the Panama Canal. His numerous books have won him the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award twice, as well as the highest civilian award possible, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. It's important to understand the high praise surrounding 1776's author, David McCullough, because it helps the reader better appreciate the way McCullough writes. His books are widely read, and his poetically descriptive style, rather than overly detailed and intellectual, makes this book appeal to everyone. In fact, it seems to be written with the intention of teaching the general public about an important piece of American history in an entertaining fashion. Does this quite successfully as presenting history as a story as opposed to a list of facts as textbooks have a tendency to do. The detailed description that McCullough provides gives readers a feel for what it was like to be a soldier during the Revolutionary War and is contributed to its thesis because it shows how much determination it took to overcome daily life at that time. He explains the soldiers were not men who had been extensively trained, furnished with exceptional weapons, or given neat uniforms. Instead, they are mostly a rough group of disorganized rebels, most of them young and dressed in rags. British officers, such as Burgoyne and Percy, referred to Washington's army as peasantry, ragamuffins, or rabble in arms. One loyalist named Benjamin Thompson went so far as to say Washington's army was the most wretchedly clothed and as dirty a set of mortals as ever disgraced the name of a soldier. They would rather let the clothes upon their backs rot than be at the trouble of cleaning them themselves. While the early months of the war went by at a relaxed pace where people took picnics on the side of the battlefield and soldiers ate rich meals every night, did not stay this way for long. Soon, winter came in 1776, and many died from the cold weather, famine, and disease. Not only did the soldiers have to face rough living conditions, but on top of that, they had to endure sporadic bloody battles where huge death tolls amounted on both sides. McCullough's thoroughly detailed account of the dreadful conditions successfully helped to prove his thesis because it shows that to overcome the situation, and win the war, the soldiers had to demonstrate bravery and determination. Uh, Trumbull's paintings, which are the ones we know best, are really um, like magnificently rendered tableaus. They show no dirt or grime or blood or suffering. And the faces of those uh, people all look very handsome and, and uh, and presentable. But life in the 18th century was much harder than we know, much harder than we live. McCullough also discusses the ambition and passion of the military officials that worked toward the Army's goal of winning. He primarily focuses on George Washington, but also gives attention to Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox. Both of these men were highly inexperienced. In fact, they had never fought in an actual battle before joining the rebel army. Despite this apparent handicap, they made themselves great generals by reading everything they could about war and military strategy. What McCullough proves through their example is that the war did not necessarily rely on brilliant, talented leaders. Rather, 
It depended upon an individual's strong will and determination. The majority of the book dedicates itself to explaining the effects of George Washington's dual heroism and indecision during 1776 on the outcome of the war. It appears clear that without Washington's guidance, the war would not have been the same by any means. He enforced the notion of discipline throughout the army, through the desperate necessity due to the fact the majority of the army was young and careless about rules and regulations. Without his leadership, they would certainly never have been able to organize well enough to wage effective attacks against the British. Another major influence he had was that he helped start the war effort. It took great persuasion for people to decide to rebel against their country, but Washington provided just that. Poor farmers and laborers saw that one of the richest men in the colonies had put all his fortune at stake for a cause and decided that it must be a worthy thing to fight for. Washington wasn't the perfect leader by any means, though. He was very indecisive throughout the war and constantly referred to his advisors to help him make decisions. For instance, the Battle of Trenton was a great military victory for America, but it wouldn't have been so effective if Washington had tried to carry it out earlier in the war like he wanted. His advisors convinced him that it would be better if he waited on this attack, and their input served the army well. This still supports his thesis because it shows Washington was level-headed enough take in the concerns of his fellow men and use them to fight the British more tactfully. He was a very human being, George Washington. And he should never be seen as the marble man or some kind of a demigod. He had his failings and he had his extraordinary strengths. He was um, not the great old founding father that we see in the Gilbert Stuart paintings with the white hair, the powdered hair, and the awkward teeth. He was 43 years old when he took command of the Continental Army. Young man. They were all young. They were all young. This is a young man's, young woman's cause, the glorious cause of America. Though the military possessed a good deal of determination, had the guiding leadership of George Washington, they still were not quite good enough to defeat the British. What gave them that slight edge that allowed them to win were their miraculous ways of good luck that allowed the army to defy all odds. Again, the Battle of Trent can be used as a primary example. There, everything appeared to be in Britain's favor. The Continental Army had just suffered tremendous losses throughout New York and morale was low, had few troops, and the weather was severe. But somehow, the American army lucked out and a few very crucial things went their way. The impractical plan of crossing the Delaware managed to succeed due to the weather that day, and the army caught the powerful Hessians off guard. This kind of luck would be a recurring theme throughout the war, and would save the army in countless desperate times. And for all intents and purposes, we were trapped and the war was over. There was no way to get out except to cross the river. And all it had needed, was needed for the British was to have the wind turn because the wind had been out of the northeast and they could bring their ships right up into the East River and there'd be no escape. Well, what happened was so uh, incredible that people still find it hard to believe. I find it hard to believe. I can't believe we won the war, <laughs> really. And the more you read about it, the more you will say it's just a miracle. It could have gone either way several times, half dozen times in this one year. As a respected historian, David McCullough seeks to present only completely factual information in his book. That being said, he is not completely without bias. It is present throughout the book that he greatly admires George Washington and this adoration could lead to an overly theatrical tone that overplays the drama of 1776. It could also make his accomplishments and defeats seem to possess more or less impact on the war than other historians would give him credit for. This minimal bias can be disregarded, though, as it does not detract from the quality of the work whatsoever, and in fact, the dramatic style only makes the story more accessible and therefore more educational. The resources that he cites provide more than enough evidence that his material is reliable. McCullough's bibliography lists hundreds of scholarly books, newspapers, and journals that he used to compile this detailed work on such a vital part of American history. 
This book should definitely be trusted by anyone seeking information about this time period for a research project. Not only is it thus full of useful information, but it also comes with an extensive index to help readers sift through the book and find out they are looking for. Overall, its chronological story-like structure makes it entertaining to read and such an engaging style helps maximize what the reader learns from the novel. 1776 deserves every bit of praise that it gets and lives up to its title of A Modern Time.